The first thing I want to point out, as you heard the, uh, the first reading that Joel uh, did for us this morning, the reading is from the book of Ecclesiasticus. It's not Ecclesiastes. Many times we get that confused. People hear it and it, they're not sure. And I, on occasion, I have people come and say, I didn't find that book in the Bible. Mm -hmm. Well, it is in the Bible. And the problem is not in the New Testament, or is it in the Old Testament. It's between the New and Old Testament. In certain Bibles, if you have a Bible that have the uh, apocryphal books as a part of the canonical books, then you have the apocryphal. I just wanted to point that out, uh, and the apocryphal, uh, depending on what, uh, who is talking to you about it, it could be seen as the hidden things or hidden books. But that more is for um, Bible study, you know, when we're looking at those books. Um, so um, we will talk more about that at that point in time. I just needed to point that out so that if you were to go home and try to find what Joe read from you, you realize that it's not in Ecclesiastes. It's Ecclesiasticus, the wisdom book, if you will, the counterpart in some way of the Proverbs. Now, to our sermon for this morning. Humility, humility, humility. The book of Ecclesiasticus and Luke's Gospel is some way a book dealing with humility. Ecclesiasticus wants to remind us, why should we take pride in this life when the end result will be decay? If we are aware of the fact that the end result is decay, then we should live this life in humility. But that's not easy for some of us. If you fast forward to Jesus and the Pharisees, he's going to address humility. But before he gets to the point of addressing humility, something else is at play. So when you look at the passage of scripture in, in your bulletin for this morning, we have Luke 14, verse 1, and then we skip 7 to 14. Verse 2 to 6 is missing. And I think it's important for us to know what's happening in verse 2 to 6 so that you can understand what else, why Jesus is not addressing in some way humility. Jesus had to have known that he was always being observed. If you are in a community and you challenge the status quo, then you put yourself in the limelight. You invite observation of you, and God knows sometimes, depending on who is looking at you, you're going to be in trouble. So Jesus, I suspect, was not on the way of the fact that wherever he was, whatever he, whatever he did, he was being Observed. So he's invited to a meal by one of the leaders of the Pharisees. The Pharisees had a love hate relationship with Jesus. They loved him when he was on their side and they despised him when he was not on their side. And he was always in trouble with them when it came to religious practices, those performances that got the attention of the community. And Jesus was always challenging them in this area. So here is Jesus on the Sabbath day invited to kneel with one of the leaders of the Pharisees, and he's on his way. I mean, I love this Jesus guy. He never turns down a good uh, fellowship. <laughs> you know, he's on his way to have kneel with the Pharisees, and he's not the only invited guest. I mean, the Pharisee has invited Jesus, and they probably have said to his friends, I'm inviting Jesus, you all come over. And they all are gathering for this meal. And Jesus is coming to the meal. Why he's on his way to the home of this Pharisee, He's met by a man who has the dropsy, as the, 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 the scripture would say. And that was um, someone who abdomen is swollen because he's retaining fluid. And there is no indication in this text that he says anything to Jesus. He doesn't ask Jesus to cure him or anything. But Jesus notices him and decides to do something. But before doing that, he challenges the Pharisees, they know they're looking at him. They're basically, now let's see what he's going to do. And Jesus, in my opinion, would not miss an opportunity to really get at them. And so, he cures the man with the drop seat, but then he challenges the Pharisees and says, look, if, if you had an animal or a child that drops in the well, what, on the Sabbath, what will you do? 
Will you let him stay in the well until the next day? Now, those are Wilma's words. But will you let him stay in the, in the well until the next day? Probably be dead already. Won't you immediately try to rescue him? Well, they can't answer. They, they know the answer is very obvious, but they will not answer. It is after this incident that they get to the Pharisees' house that Jesus will observe them doing what they normally do. The Pharisees are people who like outward show. And so they, they're jogging for position. Who's going to sit in the place of honor? And Jesus, now it, is, it turns around now. Instead of them looking at Jesus, it is Jesus who is standing and watching them. Jesus is one of the guests, so obviously he should be finding a place to sit. But instead of being a part of them fighting for where to sit, he's now a suspect standing at the door and watching them. Now they're in the, a suspect in the house. And who's going to sit there? Who's going to sit there? Because the way the arrangement was, the ones with the highest honor ended up in the middle of the room, if you will. And everybody knew who sat there then because the people who are in the middle of the room are the ones who have it all. Uh, not just money and fame and all of that good stuff. They are the ones, you, you, you're waiting for the day when you will be in the middle of the room, basically. And if I were Jesus, I would walk straight in the room and sit in the middle of the room, but, I mean, but thank God he was not woman. I mean, that's a different problem. But Jesus is standing at the door and watching them jog over position. And then it becomes an opportunity for him now to tell them the parable. When you go in, when you are invited, don't run for the place of honor. Sit in the lowest place so that when your host comes in, say, no! Woman, don't sit there. Come and sit in this chair. We just reserve for the bishop. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> No, don't sit over there. That's the place for the acolyte. Come and sit here. You know, this is what we reserve for the bishop. And everybody in the room was, oh my goodness, I didn't know that woman sat in the chair that was reserved for the bishop. Even though he's not a bishop yet. I mean, that, <laughs> ne never mind, never mind. But, you know, they take you up and you sit in that chair. Obviously, you, get, you will get the attention of everyone else in the room, won't you? I mean, the host comes in and he says, oh, well, but you're sitting in the wrong chair. This is what was reserved for you. Jesus said, in that case, you, you, you are, if you will, removed from a place of, of low, lowliness and brought to a higher place. But the reverse will be a disgrace. If Wilma came in and went and sat in the chair of the Archbishop, but I'm moving up now. I'm, I'm going from Bishop. To, I'm, I'm getting close to being a Pope. You know, I mean, <laughs> never mind, never mind. If you go and sit in that chair and the host comes and says, Oh, Wilma, I'm sorry. I mean, that chair was reserved. And now I have to come from there and sit in the chair of the lay readers. Now, I'm not going past them. Take enough away from you guys. <laughs> And you know, I mean, I'm sitting there now, I'm counting the, 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 the seconds and, and, and waiting for God, just get me out of this room, I will never do it again. Get me out, you know. Jesus is saying, don't put yourself in that position. Stay low and be brought high. Don't go high and be brought low because someone more important than you come into the room. As I read these texts in preparation for this morning, something occurred to me that it's I'm sure true for all of us. In our world, we are always observing one another. Someone said to me many years ago, you know, it's, it's amusing to me that people spend time thinking about what other people are thinking about them as if to say others don't have their own problems. I said, yeah, you know, yeah, I think of that myself. You know, we, we, we think that other people are looking at us, wondering what's wrong with us, and other people have their own stuff to do. They, they don't even have us on their radar, but never mind, we behave that way. But as I prepared for this morning, I was thinking, you know, as Jesus living in the community and being observed by all, what would it be like if Walmart one day decided to come here and put on his black castle and go to Walmart to go shopping? You knew that was coming. <laughs> and I'm shopping in Walmart in my black castle. First of all, when I walk through the door, the greeter is going to look at me and say, are you sure you're in the right place? And I'm here. I'm, I'm, I came to shopping. And not only am I in Walmart in my black castle, but I'm in the wine aisle in my black castle. <laughs> you can see all the other shoppers trying to look and see. 
First of all, they don't know what to make of me. I mean, black cats, I look like a Catholic priest, but I'm black, and they're not sure what to make of me. So they are walking around the corner, you see? Then I get to the register, and, and everybody else in line is standing there watching, okay. They will want to ask me a question, but no one is that bold enough to ask me a question. And so I'm standing there with a wine bottle in my black castle in the, the, the register. And the register probably looks at the wine, looks at me, and as if to say, the two don't go together. <laughs> Never mind, I'm buying the wine. I can assure you, someone in Walmart will follow me to the parking lot to see what, where I came from. And they will follow me into my car in the parking lot and discover on the bumper is the Episcopal Church Walker. I knew it! I knew it! He's an Episcopalian. <laughs> He's in Black Castle. He's in Walmart buying wine. God, what? what is, which other denomination did you expect to be that bold? But those Episcopalians. You and I know how people observe us, whether we want to or not. You have those out there who say, I don't go to church because those hypocrites. Thank God for those who don't go to church because hypocrites come to church. Because if they came in, they would ruin us. We don't want other people who are not hypocrites to join us. Jesus came to save the lost. And those of us that gather Sunday after Sunday in this place of worship, those of us that are called followers of Christ recognize but for the grace of God, we will not be where we are. We follow the one who came and gave his life so that we may have life and have it in his fullness. We are being observed. Whether we want to or not. And people will be disappointed because they expect us to be perfect. But I don't want to disappoint you this morning by telling you that I'm not perfect. Sometimes I like to be, pretend I am. But oftentimes when I say to someone that, look, don't look at me as an example because I'm not Jesus Christ, then people feel like, what do you mean? Well, I mean just that. The perfect one who lived among us was nailed to the cross. And that's why I don't want to be perfect. I want to be imperfect like the rest of you so that I don't get to be nailed to the cross. However, even with that situation, we still nail one another to the cross. By our criticism and our judgmental spirit and attitude. Jesus was being observed by the Pharisees to see what he was going to do when he was approached by the person who was in need. And Jesus did for that man what he needed. There is no suggestion in our text that the man even asked Jesus. No communication between Jesus and the man. But Jesus saw his need, saw beyond his physical presence, and did something for him. And the Pharisees, and they're like, that's that Jesus again. He's breaking the rules on a Saturday. And he would challenge them about the humility. You and I, whether we want to or not as Christians, will be observed by others. It is not for us to pretend in front of other people. I mean, at the end of the day, my brothers and sisters, it is God who sees our heart and knows whether what we are saying or doing is to his honor and glory. Not one of us will sit on the seat of judgment on the day of resurrection. It is the God who knows us better than we know ourselves. So when we go out, when we live our lives, when we are away from this place, and not in Walmart, in Black Castle, buying wine, I don't do that, I should point out. I never did that, so don't think that I, what I told you was not what I do. But I oftentimes go to the pavilion over there, and they know me now by name. <laughs> now, if you know what the pavilion is, you know what I'm talking about. But never mind that. If I need to buy a bottle of wine, I will buy a bottle of wine in Walmart or in the pavilion and I will not put it in a brown bag. Because at the end of the day, God knows I drink wine, and more than wine, I should point out. Because it is God who sees me for who I am. We spend so much time trying to pretend in front of one another and God is grieved by our pretenses. I have said in the past, you know, we leave home and we put on our church faces. We can't help it. You come into church, what other face will you wear? 
Not your house face. You put on your church face. You put on the face that we expect you to wear to come into this place. And God is looking at us and saying, my child, I know you by name. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. It is my relationship with you that I desire. Be who I've called you to be. But you and I spend so much time trying to be other than who God has called us to be because we think other people are spending their every waking hour looking at us. If others are spending their time looking at me, good for them. They can keep looking and I will keep failing them because I am not perfect. But for the grace of God, I try each day to live in my relationship with God. And you and others may look at me and sometimes be disappointed and other times be impressed. But when all is said and done, it is the one who sees Wilma when no one else is looking that I'm seeking to live in a relationship with that has nothing to do with your expectation of me or not. But as I conclude, I should point out, I'm human. And every now and then I'm sucked into being concerned about how you see me and what you think of me. And so I get into the pretense. But I pray that we all would take seriously our walk with God has very little to do with our outward religious performances. And so that when all is said and done, that same God can look us in the face and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant.